and I would like to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Andre Dubo. Uh, he's a Russian neurosurgeon and he's an expert of uh, neurovascular surgery, has operated more than 2,000 uh, vascular aneurysms and uh, did more than 200 AV malformation surgery. And he has operated more than 30 cases of brainstem cavernomas. And he's a really an expert of uh, bypass surgery. He has operated more than 300 low flow bypass, 50 high flow bypass, and 50 intracranial bypasses, 12 IMAX artery bypasses. He's published two books in which one was, uh, he was main author, Tactics of Surgical Treatment for Cerebral Aneurysms, and he was co-author of Complications of the Brain Surgery. He's published more than 50 papers in national, international journals, and he's a member of WFNS, ACNS Educational Committee, and member of International Advisory Board of AJNS, Asian Journal of Neurosurgery. He has two patents also, one patent for invention, one patent for utility model, and attended specialization and observership courses in, at 12 different places. And currently he is working at Federal Center of Neurosurgery, Nosibirst, where he is head of neurovascular department and uh, <coughs> continuing that department. So I would like to invite our professor, Dr. Andre Dubois, to present his lecture on intra intracranial bypass surgery for complex aneurysms. Please, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, my friends. Uh, I'm very happy to see you now. Hello, dear colleagues, dear friends. Today, I will tell you about intra-intracranial anastomosis in surgical treatment of complex cerebral aneurysms. Let me introduce myself. I'm Andre Dubavoy. I live in Novosibirsk. This is the biggest Siberian city located at the south part of the Great Siberian Plate. I am work in Federal Neurosurgical Center as neurovascular surgeon. So, intra-intracranial anastomosis. Sometimes it's advisable to use intra-intracranial anastomosis for some types of complex aneurysms. You know about four main types of intra-intracranial bypasses. Uh, first of them, reanastomosis. Uh, second of them, reanastomosis with short interposition graft needs to make a two uh, anastomosis line with uh, graft uh, from one end on and the next uh, second end of the graft. Next of them, reimplantation and uh, the last bypass in situ. According to classification introduced by Professor Michael Lawton in his book, Seven Bypasses, we consider that all four types uh, of intra intracranial anastomosis belong to the third generation. You can see third generation. When to use which intracranial anastomosis option? Uh, first of all, if you have insufficient length of the donor artery or graft, for example, uh, you need uh, to revascularization of the anterior cerebral artery territory, uh, you, mm, you don't use uh, STA in this time because the length of the STA is uh, very short to reach the ACA territory. And you can use uh, inside to bypass between uh, closely running a two or a three segments of the anterior cerebral artery. Next, a large number of the efferent arteries. For example, uh, at this picture, you can see the quadrifurcation of the M2, M, uh, M1, M2 uh, aneurysm uh, with four branches running from the aneurysmal dome. Uh, you can try to uh, clip this aneurysm radically, but uh, sometimes uh, one or two branches uh, may be compromised. And uh, the good reason uh, to reject, uh, could, to cut off these branches and reimplant it into another branch uh, running uh, very closely, for example, M2 or M3, and, uh, uh, or uh, making bypass in situ. And uh, next, the possibility of total elimination uh, of pathology. For example, you can see uh, the small fusiform aneurysm of the M1 segment. 
uh, you can uh, cut off this aneurysm and then uh, switching uh, the ends of the M1 segment between M2, uh, M1 and M1. Um, some words about equipment of the operation room. To check, by spice, uh, to check bypass patency, we use interoperative ultrasound tools. First of them, this is flow metry station with Charbel probes. Uh, we use uh, the probes of different calibers. And uh, next, uh, this is contact ultrasound Doppler. Uh, usually we use uh, one or uh, two millimeters probes for contact uh, Dopplerography. Let's look at examples, all options of intracranial anastomosis. The first of the option is reanastomosis. If you have a fusiform aneurysm, you can reject it and sue the ends of the artery together. This is a, a suing line. Uh, this uh, type of uh, anastomosis mm, uh, you can use uh, only in the very closely in, in case of very close uh, two ends of the uh, artery. Uh, an example of our work, uh, complex M2 aneurysm of the right MCA. You can see the dissection aneurysm of the uh, superior trunk uh, of the M2 segment of uh, right MCA with daughter sac. I think uh, uh, very easy to uh, delete it, the part of the aneurysm, and then uh, placing the clips along the M2 segment. But after resection the aneurysm and placing the clips, I try to check the blood flow through the M2 segment, and blood, blood flow is not uh, very good. It's very, very low. I try to apply an, uh, fenestrated clips, uh, and checking the blood flow, the blood flow is not so good it, at this time too. I third time try to place in uh, clips another uh, and uh, checking the blood flow through them too, and the uh, blood flow is very very low. Fourth time I try to uh, clip in the neck of the aneurysm, and the uh, blood flow also is very very bad. I decided to reject the aneurysm and uh, perform uh, intracranial bypass between uh, two ends of the M2 segment. Uh, you can see dilated aneurysm. You can see interpreted photo. Uh, this is a, a line of the end to end anastomosis. And the control CT angio, you don't see the line of the anastomosis. And uh, good uh, condition of the brain after surgery and patients three days after surgery without any neurological deficit. Next case, giant calcified thrombosed aneurysm located M in M3 segment of the left MCA. Uh, this patient had uh, a giant aneurysm located inside the insula. Uh, she had uh, seizures. You can see uh, M3 segment and the calcified neck of the aneurysm and calcified walls of the aneurysm. This is interoperative video. Uh, this is outflow, inflow, and soft neck. I'm happy because I think I place in the clip and uh, the operation is uh, done. Uh, but in this case, uh, after um, placing the clips, you can see the bleeding from the neck area. I uh, place in uh, the cl uh, temporal clips to inflow artery and to the outflow artery. Both of them M3, M3 segments. Then I reject uh, the aneurysm, cut off the outflow artery, then cut off inflow artery, then flushing the lumen of the arteries and uh, then making the ends of the arteries marking and placing my first stitch. 
in this case, I perform a bypass between two ends of M3 segment and to inflation. Before placing, uh, before placing uh, uh, last two stitches, I flashen the aneurysm cavity and placing last two stitches. For flushing, we use uh, piperinized salim. The anastomosis is done. Removing the temporary clips. And you can see anastomosis line, checking the blood flow using ultrasound Doppler, and then removing thrombotic masses from the aneurysm cavity. Next day, CT angio, you can see this loop. This loop, uh, uh, this is uh, M3 and another M3. This is anastomosis line, another projection, superior projection, this is axial projection, uh, and the empty aneurysm cavity. Next case, uh, ramp anastomosis in posterior circulation. Uh, we have a patient, female patient, for, uh, C, um, five, 54 years old from another country. Uh, she uh, underwent the calling of the aneurysm in 2013. Uh, during six years, she don't perform a control DSA. And after that, uh, she performed control DSA and uh, we see uh, the uh, compactization of the uh, of the coils inside the dome of the aneurysm and the uh, big remnant neck. Uh, I want to place in the clip uh, on the neck. This small operation video shows open the cisterna magna, checking the outflow. This is medulla. I'm detaching the aneurysm from uh, medulla and from 11th nerve, very strong adhesions between a medulla and uh, aneurysm. You can see the coils outside the aneurysm, detaching the 11th nerve, and uh, try to clip the neck of the aneurysm. But after clipping, I check uh, the outflow. Uh, and the pike outflow is very, very bad, very, very low. I decided to uh, open the aneurysm and remove the coils. This time I use uh, big scissors because the small scissors, uh, small scissors not cutting the coils. And then you can see the ostium inflow, ostium outflow, ostium inside the neck of the aneurysm. I tried to place a clip, but the flow is not good at this time too. I place in uh, the temporary clips, flushing the cavity of the neck, preparing the neck to the suture and switching the neck without any clipping. After starting blood flow, after starting blood flow, the pl blood flow is very, very low, not good. I decided to reject the aneurysm. I perform resection. Flushing the lumen of the artery and making anastomosis between two ends of picas and two end fashion. Start blood flow. Good feeling of the pica. You can see anastomosis line. Checking blood flow, very, very good. 
the patient without any neurological deficit. Next day, we perform DSA. Good, you can see the good feeling, right, Pika? Yes. Next type of anastomosis, rhinostomosis with short interposition graft. This type of anastomosis needs to place in uh, interposition graft. As interposition graft, you can use uh, the graft matching on the diameter with uh, suturing uh, arteries. Uh, uh, I uh, use in uh, uh, radial artery, uh, sometimes using ST8 rank, radial artery uh, diameter around 2.5 millimeters, uh, radial uh, um, ST8 rank uh, graft uh, around two millimeters. Sometimes we need uh, to use a more uh, biggest graft uh, in this uh, case. I um, use a Safian's vein graft. Uh, very interesting case. Uh, this is fem this female uh, had a, a very strong compression of hyacin. You can see a big uh, thrombosed A1 uh, aneurysm. We perform DSA, or, and this patient shows uh, no feeling uh, through the ACOM. And uh, uh, we decided to reject the aneurysm. Uh, during the uh, performing uh, approach, in this case, I use a pteranal approach, I harvest in uh, the STA trunk. And then after resection of the aneurysm, I place this uh, two centimeters trunk between uh, ACA, uh, between uh, ICA and uh, a2 segment of the ACA. This is a first anastomosis between ICA and uh, interposition graft. This is a place of the second anastomosis between A2 and interposition graft. This is another projection. First anastomosis, second anastomosis. Uh, the patient after surgery doing very well and uh, uh, partially uh, recovering uh, her uh, vision. Third uh, type of bypasses, uh, reimplantation. Sometimes uh, we have a fusiform aneurysm. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, we can uh, cut off uh, the uh, artery uh, just after the aneurysm and reimplant this artery to another arteries, for example, in M2 or in uh, M1 segment or in M3 segment to the M3 segment. And uh, then uh, we can uh, place the clip uh, to the neck of the aneurysm and uh, clipping this aneurysm as uh, simple circular. Uh, the case of uh, complex fusiform aneurysm of the distal part of anterior temporal artery of the right MCA. You can see CT angel before surgery. Uh, from this uh, fusiform aneurysm arising uh, the anterior temporal artery, you can see this artery. This is 3D CT angel, anterior temporal artery. You can see this artery running from the aneurysm, from the fusiform aneurysm. This is M1 segment. This is bifurcation of M1, anterior temporal artery. This uh, operation video, first of all, I clipping the neck of the aneurysm, preserving the blood flow through the small perforator located near the neck. Then cut off the anterior temporal artery, good place to switching to the M1 segment, flushing the lumen of the artery. And then I prepare the end of the uh, anterior temporal artery by fish mouse fashion, placing my first stitch, then temporary clip M1 segment, the duration of uh, clipping of M1, in this case, uh, around 18 minutes. 
making a liner incision inside M1, flushing the lumen, dilating thrombos, and placing the first stitch at the heel, neck and the toe, and then switching all anastomosis. Time to replacing, uh, removing the clips. You can see anterior temporal artery reimplanted into the M1 segment. Checking the blood flow through the M1, through the anterior temporal artery. The blood flow, blood flow is good. Then I uh, reject the aneurysm. And this is a final result. Uh, CT angel after surgery next day. You can see the reimplanted artery, M1 reimplanted artery. You cannot see any reason. This one reimplant. Complex right A2, A3, any reason. Another reimplantation. You can see broad neck aneurysm with arising from the dome uh, callosum marginal artery. This is operation video. You can see aneurysm arising from the dome callosum marginal artery. This is pericallosal artery, right pericallosal artery, with a thin, very thin neck. I try uh, to clip in uh, this aneurysm along the pericallosal artery, but this type of clipping is compromised uh, the blood flow inside the callosal marginal artery. Uh, checking the blood flow through the pericallosal artery. I saw uh, the left pericallosal artery running just uh, superiorly uh, then the left pericallosal artery. And I decided uh, to reimplant uh, the callosal marginal artery from the right side to the left pericallosal artery. I'm cut callosal marginal artery from the right side, flushing the lumen, then placing my first stitch before the temporary clipping of the left pericallosal artery. Then clip left pericallosal artery, making a hole, then making a liner incision inside left pericallosal artery, flushing the lumen and making anastomosis end to side fashion between uh, left pericallosal artery and callosum marginal artery from the right side. Starting blood flow. And you can see the final result. This is anastomosis line. This is left pericallosal artery and right callosum marginal artery. Next day in VP form, DSA, you can see good feeling of the pericallosal artery. You cannot see the aneurysm. And this is a left ICA uh, injection. And you can see the uh, left ICA and branches of ICA feeling, anterior cerebral artery. And you can see the uh, right callosum marginal artery feeling from the left ICA injection. This is 3D CT engine. And the last type of uh, bypasses, inside a bypass. Uh, sometimes you have uh, a fusiform aneurysm and uh, uh, the uh, running uh, very closely uh, two or three uh, arteries. In this case, you can reject this aneurysm or trap this aneurysm. And uh, uh, before this, uh, you need to uh, perform uh, 
in situ bypass between uh, closely running arteries. For example, between A3 arteries, M2 arteries, M3 arteries, uh, between pica loops. Uh, you can see the example of the bypass in situ between two A3 A3 segments. You can see a giant uh, aneurysm located in uh, A1, A2 uh, connection of the right uh, anterior uh, cerebral artery. This is a filling part. Uh, this is uh, A3 segments before making a bypass. After that, we make a bypass. You can see operation photo after uh, starting the bypass and CT angel next day after surgery. This is uh, uh, anastomosis zone. Uh, then we delete in the aneurysm and uh, the patient doing well without any neurological deficit and uh, no need to place in VP shunt. Uh, next, uh, bypass in situ in posterior circulation. A uh, small fusiform aneurysm located at the origin of the left pica. Uh, you can see the two caudal loops of the picas and uh, anastomosis between uh, two caudal loops, uh, side to side fashion. Then uh, I trap the aneurysm. Uh, on the control DSA, you can see uh, the good feeling both pica territories, and you can see the anastomosis zone without feeling of the aneurysm. Uh, this is very interesting case. The patient, uh, 41 years old man, had only one uh, pica, only right pica, without uh, left pica, both pica territories, feeling uh, from the right side. And you can see the fusiform aneurysm located uh, on the distal part of the lateral medullar segment of the uh, right pica. Uh, uh, I saw the uh, pica loops uh, running very closely and I decided to perform um, by bypass in situ between uh, this uh, part of pica and this part of pica and then trap the aneurysm. Uh, we don't have a video of this operation because we perform this operation on uh, another um, in a, the another clinic without uh, video recordings. And I have a, um, a drawing uh, of this uh, operation. The diagram, the first uh, step, uh, I saw the uh, two uh, uh, loops of pica running very closely. Then I make uh, bypass uh, side to side between uh, pica and uh, pica between uh, the uh, loops of uh, one pica, and then I trap the aneurysm. Uh, the patient uh, without any neurological deficit. This is a control DSA uh, next day. You can see anastomosis zone between uh, one part of pica and the uh, uh, next part uh, of pica uh, without uh, feeling of the aneurysm. Very interesting case. And the last the combination of the different bypass options. Uh, in this case, uh, I combined uh, in extra intracranial bypass uh, and reanastomosis intra intracranial bypass. You can see the very interesting aneurysm uh, with atherosclerotic changes and calcification. Uh, you can see calcification walls. Uh, this uh, case, uh, this is a recorded video. This is aneurysmal dome. This is uh, frontal branch, uh, very fragile, and uh, we have uh, bleeding from the connection uh, of the uh, frontal branch. I decided to delete in the aneurysmal dome for uh, minimizing the traction of the aneurysm. I delete in the aneurysmal dome, then I perform uh, uh, deleting the uh, atherosclerotic plaque inside the uh, neck, flushing the neck. And then I uh, try to clip in the neck, but the flow is very bad. And uh, after removing the clip from the 
uh, frontal uh, from the temporal branch of um, two i i saw the very strong bleeding i tried to uh, attach uh, this uh, temporal uh, branch m2 to the aneurysmal dome but it's uh, very very good, bad idea i decided to cut off temporal branch of m2 and uh, suturing this temporal branch with uh, temporal trunk uh, with parietal trunk of the sta by end to end fashion uh, next i try to check uh, uh, the flow through the m1 to m2 and the flow is not good the flow is stopped because the, the neck area is thrombosed i removing the thrombotic masses from the neck flushing the neck uh, using a heparinized saline but uh, clipping in this case is very dangerous because all times you can uh, uh, you can uh, have a compromised flow i decided to resect the aneurysm and making uh, Intra intracranial bypass between M1, this is M1, and M2, end to end fashion, starting blood flow through the M1. The blood flow is good through the M1 to the frontal M2, and the temporal M2, uh, the blood flow coming from the STA. This is a final result. No ischemic uh, complications on DWI. And you can see the STA uh, connected uh, with the temporal trunk and the intra intracranial bypass between M1 and the frontal M2. On conclusions, Mastering the technique of creating intra intracranial anastomosis will expand the capabilities of a neurosurgeon in treatment of complex aneurysms. However, this method needs high demands on microsurgical skills, as neurosurgeon has to work in narrow and deep spaces with tight time constraints. Intra intracranial anastomosis ensures sufficient blood flow in the recipient artery territory that confirmed clinically and flow metrically. As an, an alternative to the creation of intra-intracranial anastomosis, uh, revascularization using extra intracranial bypasses can be considered. However, to create the required length of the donor arteries, it is necessary to curve out large skin flaps. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so thanks, much. Thanks. For this great talk. And uh, it was a very, very nice presentation for young neurosurgeons like us. And uh, we are dealing with uh, simple cases on a regular basis. But whenever we fa uh, face difficult, complex aneurysms, these techniques, they come in handy. And uh, uh, sir, I have a few questions like, uh, what is the usual duration in which you do one bypass procedure uh, the starting from first suture to the uh, beginning the blood flow how much time it will take uh, the time is very different because uh, the complexity of the bypass is very different too uh, very different the depths of the operation field uh, sometimes the field is very narrow sometimes it's very wide and uh, my the my Mm, minimum time is around 15 minutes uh, uh, from the uh, placing the clips to the recipient artery uh, to the starting blood flow. And the, uh, the biggest time around 50 minutes, around 50, 49, 48, around 50 minutes. It's very long uh, because uh, it's uh, sometimes uh, in case in some cases I have a very very difficult uh, conditions for suturing. 
thank you professor and uh, do you feel that after um, like what is the danger time when you feel that uh, it, it, it can cause a thrombosis in distal part because the blood flow is stagnant because of the application of clip uh, like in 49 minutes uh, did you find any infarct or ischemia in post op yes sometimes we have a complication um, with uh, infarction of the uh, local areas uh, uh, supplying this artery uh, but in our cases uh, we don't have any uh, uh, we don't have a very strong neurological deficit but sometimes we have uh, uh, ischemic focus uh, on the uh, DWI on the MRI. Small changes. Small, small changes, yes. Okay. And Professor, uh, what, what is the suture material you are using for bypass surgery? The... Uh, I prefer to switch in uh, using the etilon, etilon uh, 10 zeros. Etilon. Sometimes I uh, switch in uh, using 11 zeros. Uh, only in cases of moya moya. Thank you. Thank you for so much. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. And I would like to invite others to ask questions if they have. And, yes. Uh, excuse me. Can 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 I ask some question? Yes, it. I yeah. Very nice conversation. Uh, my brother and the. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, my brother. Yeah, very perfect and. Uh, uh, as as Mero, as a neuro interventionist, I I just uh, study about the uh, uh, pathophysiology of the dissecting a neurosim, especially the fusiform neurosim. But uh, in in the principle of treatment, just only excision. I ne never think a uh, neurosurgeon can ex excision in everywhere of fusiform neurosim, but you can do it very well. This is just so amazing, yeah. But uh, I can I have uh, for two questions. For the first one, do you have uh, an experience to to use the keep reconstruction in some case that uh, cannot uh, uh, to perform anatomosis directly, like a uh, very short uh, for the donor side and recipient side is cannot stretch or uh, is very tight. Tightening to uh, uh, anatomosis. This is the first question, and the second question: How can uh, aware about the perforator uh, injury during uh, perform the uh, anatomosis, especially in the complex of uh, A1, A2 aneurysm? Be because at that area is um, uh, has many. <coughs> Uh, recurrent of herbner or traumatic artery. How you can uh, be aware? Uh, how how you can pre prevent the this uh, perforating uh, artery injury? This is uh, thank, uh, of my two questions. Yes. Uh, thank you, Iti. Um, uh, I try to ask you uh, from second question. Uh, yeah. In uh, my uh, experience, um, I don't uh, see the perforators from the A1 segment uh, in cases of uh, the big fusiform aneurysm. Uh, in these cases, uh, it's possible to trap this aneurysm because the uh, aneurysm don't consist uh, big perforators. And uh, in cases of M1 aneurysm, Sometimes, uh, sometimes I mm, saw the big uh, perforators, and uh, I think uh, the uh, these perforators is very, very uh, neat to the patient. Uh, and uh, in these cases, I mm, don't perform uh, trapping or resection of the aneurysm, uh, only uh, proximal or distal clipping. Uh, just after the making uh, bypasses uh, to preserve the blood flow into the perforators. And uh, uh, about your first question, uh, is I right uh, understand you, your question about uh, the, the insufficient uh, artery lens for uh, 
uh, uh, the anastomosis, yes? It yes, is. yes. 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 Uh, in the cases of insufficient uh, length of anastomosis, I uh, try to uh, uh, use uh, a more uh, 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 artery uh, or you. Uh, one second, please. Um, uh, in cases of a sufficient and sufficient length of uh, uh, artery, I need to uh, dissect this artery alone uh, 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 and free from the arachnoid. And uh, sometimes I uh, cut in the small, small arteries uh, on the uh, small uh, branching arteries and uh, the length of the recipient or arteries uh, is uh, um, more higher in this case. And uh, Sometimes I need to uh, use an um, interposition graft in these cases uh, because uh, the very high time of the uh, anastomosis zone uh, will lead to compromise the blood flow inside the uh, anastomosis and the anastomosis uh, will uh, thrombose in this case. Excellent answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, the Andrew. Thank uh, you. Yeah, nice presentation. I missed just the first 10 minutes, your presentation, but the, the, your ability and your skill has much improved. I, I'm very happy to see that. Thank you so Thank much. You. So Thank just I want, just I have one question for you. Uh, so what about uh, uh, the treatment of the uh, uh, perforators? So the perforator problem is uh, the big issue. So such as the ACOM, because uh, you catch the both ACOM and uh, put the anastomosis. So any problem of the power reading arteries? Uh, so um, uh, thank you, Professor, for this question. Uh, I had only one case uh, with uh, replacing A1 segment. And in this case, uh, the perforating arteries uh, running from the, uh, uh, from the uh, big uh, from the a2 segment and no perforators from the uh, aneurysm and uh, around the aneurysm at the a1 segment it's very ha i'm very happy because <laughs> if i ha have uh, perforators uh, arising from the aneurysm i don't perform this uh, surgery uh, because uh, the perforators uh, was compromised yeah it's wonderful thank you so much thank you thank you professor Any questions? Uh, may I have a question, Professor Duboy? Thank you for this wonderful uh, lecture. It looks like you perform more, more bypasses than clipping of the aneurysms. <laughs> looks great, but I have two questions actually. Uh, what do you use for neuroprotection if you use something during the clipping, uh, during the bypass process? And um, what is your, um, I can say med medical follow therapy after bypass do you use any antiplatelet drag or, or or anything like like similar clexan or or anything else thank you yes uh, very interesting questions because uh, we usually used antiplatelet therapy uh, be before uh, the surgery uh, one week before surgery we uh, began to take uh, patient uh, uh, 100 milligram of the aspirin 100 milligram and uh, then uh, we recommend to uh, use uh, this dosage of the aspirin during uh, half of year of this patient uh, and uh, your first question about uh, uh, about uh, neuroprotection uh, about neuroprotection the, yes, yes. Use any neuroprotection Thank you. As, neuro, uh, as neuroprotection, uh, we use only increasing the blood flow around 20% uh, from initial uh, patient level without any barbiturate, uh, without any drugs, only increasing the blood uh, pressure. Oh, thank you. Thank you very well. Thank you. Any questions? Any more questions? Uh, I would like to ask one question, please. Um, Professor Andre, if 
you have um, an alternative or um, options to do end to end or side to side. Uh, which one do you uh, prioritize as your first uh, option? Thank you. Uh, your question about alternation or alternative option uh, in microsurgical uh, or endovascular? In in microsurgical, uh, um, I mean, if you can do in one case an an end to end anastomosis or side to side anastomosis, you can do both in that case. Uh, which one do you prefer? Do you uh, I mean? Do you prioritize oh, I, the end to end first, then uh, this and uh, side to side, or uh, like that? Uh, I um, understand you. It depends of uh, the conditions uh, in each uh, surgery, uh, because uh, uh, side to side anastomosis uh, uh, is uh, more difficult uh, than the end to end anastomosis, and uh, requiring more time for uh, suturing. And uh, sometimes uh, uh, this anastomosis uh, need to perform more uh, longer liner incision uh, on the both arteries. Uh, in this uh, case, uh, the, uh, uh, the leaving of the anastomosis uh, is more longer and uh, uh, the anastomosis is uh, more pattern patent in future, but need uh, more time for making. And, and how, how, uh, how often do you need uh, to do some uh, insurance anastomosis for, uh, for uh, doing a complex aneurysm anastomosis? Uh, approximately in 50% uh, of all anastomosis I uh, make uh, insurance uh, before the making the main of uh, the main anastomosis. Not okay. in each time. Okay, so thank, thank you. you. So, so the decision to do anastomosis is, I mean, we have to have it on our mind before the operation that we can do some anastomosis as an alternative like that or something. Yes. Uh, sometimes I see uh, the conditions of the suture is very well. I don't uh, perform uh, ensuring anastomosis. And uh, in uh, uh, cases, uh, the conditions of the suture is very difficult. I first I perform uh, insurance anastomosis. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. May I ask a question? Yes, thank you. And listen to you. Yes, so thank you very much. Uh, Professor uh, Andrew, uh, thank you very much. I can even speak a little bit of Russian because I've graduated from Moscow. My basic medical education was from Moscow. So, спасибо вам большое. Thank you very much. I had I a question you. that uh, so in in case of uh, especially pediatric children with moya moya, the vessels are very small and very delicate. Whenever you're taking a stitch, uh, yes, especially yes. with the proline or it's long, the the stitch the eye is little bigger than the the suture material and so it leaves a hole there what is your experience on expandable suture materials especially the vascular surgeon they use these suture materials have you ever used it uh, the expandable suture materials the question about about uh, type of materials uh, i use yes. in my my cases in my my cases yes. we use uh, nylon uh, uh, we prefer the etylon uh, mm, uh, 11 zeros, sometimes 12 zeros, but in Russia, 12 zeros is very, very rare. Uh, and uh, we usually use 10 or 11 zeros. In uh, the small art, switching the small arteries around uh, half of millimeters, we use 11 zeros. The arteries uh, around one millimeter, we use uh, uh, 10 zeros. Okay. Only 80 Thank long. You. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Ishu, I think there is a question from the participant, uh, question and answer. Yes, I, I should read it. Uh, Professor Andri, uh, there is one question. Uh, yes. 
Dr. Tom B. He has mentioned that a good and illustrative lecture. Thank you. According to the case with single pica loop anastomosis, was the end-to-end -end anastomosis more difficult? Not uh, end to end, to end uh, not more difficult, but. Uh, uh, in this case, I uh, prefer uh, uh, side to side because uh, the two uh, part of arteries running uh, 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 running very closely and uh, uh, very good conditions to switch in uh, side to side bypass. Very good conditions. Thank you. I, I hope uh, Dr. Tom got the answer. If there are any questions, please ask. Otherwise, we should proceed to the next lex next lecture. So, thank you, thank you, Professor. Andrei. Thank you, thank you, my friends. Thank you. thank you, thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, I would ask uh, my friend Dr. Thomas Tommy uh, to introduce our next speaker. Please, Dr. Thomas. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ishu. Uh, we will continue for the second uh, speaker on our session here. Um, the, the second uh, uh, speaker is Dr. Sachin Shemet, is a neurosurgeon from India, uh, Apollo Hospitals in Chennai, and also an alumni of uh, the association, uh, Fujita Health University Alum uh, Alumni Association. And we'll uh, have a talk about endoscopic optic nerve fenestration in idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And also, Dr. Sashin is uh, has a good, uh, I mean, working together with uh, Dr. Raja and Dr. Liu for the webinars of ACNS. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sashin. Uh, please uh, have your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Thomas, for a, a short presentation. Just one note, yet not the member of Alumni Association. I wish to go to uh, Nagoya uh, uh, for uh, my fellowship uh, and to uh, Professor Yoko Kato also for my fellowship. Unfortunately, because of the COVID, ongoing COVID pandemic, uh, Japan is not acting that moment. So thank you for that. I hope in the future I will be a member of Alumni Association. Anyway, thank you for the opportunity for the presentation. I think it's a nice idea. Uh, Dr. Alberto, my friend, is not there. He had suggested this idea to collaborate the Alumni Association and the YNS Committee. So thank you. That's a great idea. So today I'm going to talk about endoscopic optimization at the outset. To thank Professor Yuko Kato for her support in the education for young neurosurgeons and all the fellows. Uh, and, uh, a small introduction, as you can see, the past few decades, uh, obesity has become a major problem. Almost it's like a, a epidemic, uh, ongoing epidemic in most of the countries. And this entity, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, is associated with obesity. Most of the patients, almost 97% of the patients are obese. And along with that, it carries two burden. One is severe headache, second is visual loss, and sometimes even infertility. So the terminology, benign intracranial hypertension is absolutely possible to uh, distinguish, especially the malignant intracranial hypertension. So we use only idiopathic intracranial hypertension. The other synonym is idiopathic tumor cerebri. So basically a definition, it's a condition characterized by increase in intracranial pressure, but there is no evidence of any intracranial mass, hydrocephalus, or infection. You see, history, uh, lumbar puncture was introduced in 1891 by surgeon Hendrick, and two years after that, he uh, described this entity, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Uh, he reported 10 cases, seven for women and three women. Originally, he called it as meningitis serosa. After that, uh, uh, they renamed it as pseudo cerebri in 1904 by neurologist Max Noon. Then neurosurgeon Professor Walter Dandy reported 22 case series over last over less over seven years in 1937, and he diagnosed it by lumbar puncture and pneumo and 
that time pneumo encephalography one of the main methodology for diagnosing hydrocephalus he treated it that time with subtemporal decompression and that was the basis for dandy's criteria of uh, diagnosing idiopathic intracranial hypertension for a long time in 1955 a neurologist joseph michael foley coined the term benign intracranial hypertension but as i said it's absolute now because he coined it basically to distinguish it from the malignant causes of intracranial hypertension so as long as the epidemiology is concerned it's more common in the field obesity is reported in almost 90% of cases peak incidence in the decade myth that is entity is associated with certain things and those myths are that it is not associated with malign in with, with the pregnancy with the oral contraceptive pills corticosteroids and regular menses irregular menses but what it is associated with is certain drugs like nalidix acid nitrofurantoin vitamin a indomethacin isotretinoin one of the most common problems in case of younger people uh, the acne is for that they frequently given thyroid replacement therapy and lithium apart from that there are certain diseases uh, which are associated with idiopathic intracranial hypertension and some of the disorders are known to result in increased viscosity of the csf so that is one of the reason but in some of the says what is the link or what is the cause still not clear and this is a big list of these diseases now there is a society for idiopathic intracranial hypertension a society of idiopathic intracranial hypertension and chaired by susan p bolon and he has given a consensus guideline in 2018 and they basically divided uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension in common symptoms idiopathic intracranial hypertension with papillary edema and idiopathic intracranial hypertension without papillary edema common symptoms there's big list of symptoms but headache and visual obstruction is the two most common symptoms in case of standard idiopathic uh, hypertension with papillary edema the criteria is papillary edema normal neuro neurological examination except sometimes you may get a six nerve palsy neuroimaging you will not have any standard uh, typical idiopathic finding a normal csf constituent but there is a elevated lumbar puncture pressure more than 25 cm of csf now sometimes you may get idiopathic intracranial hypertension without papillary edema and in that cases the neurological findings with the three neurological findings which are very important i'll come to that so these three neurological findings are especially in relation first in relation to the cella can be empty cella or can be a partially empty cella which is making the pituitary uh, stock uh, height reduced second thing sometimes optic nerve uh, there will be a perioptic csf causing uh, compression over the optic nerve and when the optic nerve goes atrophied becomes tortuous sometimes this optic nerve it sort of uh, protruded inside the globe and when you uh, look through your ophthalmoscope it appears as a protrusion of optic nerve head inside and the posterior globe it will get it will become flattened because of the protrusion of optic nerve sometimes in cases but not all the cases you may find uh, one of the transfer sinus or sometimes even the bilateral transfer sinus are either uh, completely occluded or stenosed and that also uh contributes to one of the proposed pathogenesis of uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension that is uh, sinus or venous hypertension now as long as the diagnostic principles are concerned one of the most important thing is for optimal investigation of the patient with papillary edema and visual loss there must be a clear cut communication between the neurosurgeon or neurologist or a clinician who is seeing the patient for the first time and with their various other specialties because you're going to investigate this patient for lot of things But the basic aim of the all the investigation of the papillary edema are two things. One is to find if any if there is any underlying disease or any treatable cause is there or not, like the diseases or the drugs which I mentioned. Then you can treat it. And second thing is protect the vision and ensure there is a timely re-examination of the vision because sometimes vision can deteriorate spontaneously and in that case you need a urgent intervention. so this is the protocol given by the uh, society of idiopathic intracranial hypertension and we follow the same protocol that once the papillary edema is suspected or identified we record three things the visual acuity the visual field and fundus photograph you check the blood pressure just to rule out the malignant papillary hypertension and then go ahead with the imaging in the imaging if there is no lesion then we'll do lumbar puncture and if the opening pressure is more than 20 cm of csf then uh, the diagnosis of idiopathic intracranial hypertension is paid after that there are three more entities or three 
the sort of classification is given, uh, which is fulminant idiopathic anterior hypertension, typical and atypical. Fulminant is nothing when the vision is rapidly deteriorating and it's at risk and you have to do something. An urgent intervention is required. A typical is when the patient is a female, patient is of young age in third decade and the body mass index is more than 30 kilogram per meter square. That is, she's obese. Or typical when this thing is not there, that if the patient is not a female or male, or if it's not a reproductive age group or not a male. Now, the basic idea of treatment of any idiopathic intracranial hypertension is the, the main center of your treatment is vision. Whenever vision is normal or vision is not at risk, you can give medical treatment. So all our patients, which we had, if the vision was not at risk, we had proposed the medical treatment, which was basically in the four forms. One is the diet management to reduce the weight, then weight reduction or some medicine to re reduce the weight, uh, and uh, physiotherapy, basically uh, exercise to reduce the weight, and certain drugs, pharmacological drugs like acetazolamide or uh, uh, Lasix. Now, I'll come to our study. So what I'm presenting is basically uh, uh, a prospective randomized control trial, which we are doing at the four centers, but I am only allowed to present only my study. So the aim of our study was, as I said, obesity is the main problem, and this condition can be treated medically also. But when the medical treatment fails, or if the vision is at risk, then surgical option is there. But there is obvious controversy or debate to uh, which surgical procedure is the preferred surgical options whether optic nerve fenestration, whether open or endoscopic, whether it's CSF shunting, the VP shunt or LP shunt, or nowadays even the stunting of the transverse sinus or any of the sinus which is, uh, which is occluded or stenosis, it's also one of the proposed treatment. So the aim of our study was is basically to evaluate the efficacy, safety of endoscopic optic nerve sheath fenestration in the patient with idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So at my center, Apollo Hospital, uh, study started from June 2018 and still ongoing. But first, at, uh, we concluded at October 2020. The exclusion criteria was patient with the optic atrophy. Those patients who already got optic atrophy and complete vision loss to the extent that they're barely able to just perception of vision, and then uh, we've not done this. And patient unfit for the surgery because of any reason. Ethical concern, we've got the clearance of ethical committee from all the centers and from my center. So at my center, I've had 12 consecutive patients. Fortunately, we had all female patients. We've never had any male patient. Median age was 21. As I said, the second and third decade is the most uh, 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 prominent uh, age of presentation with the clinical, ophthalmological, and radiological diagnosis of idiopathic intracranial hypertension admitted at our hospital at this uh, duration. So out of 12, six patients had undergone a unilateral, all the patients we've done only unilateral endoscopic optic nerve sheath penetration, and all patients were followed up for one to four years. The mean follow-up was 2.5 years. So there is one uh, representative video of optic nerve sheath penetration I would like to show, and then we'll go to the literature. And uh, so this is a representative video. So a patient, 21 years old, obese, 85 kgs, headache, and bilateral vision loss, perception of light in one eye, and other eye had a good vision. So that you can see on the radiology, perioptic CSF, you can see perioptic CSF here, the cella was empty, the classical presentation, the fundus photography we do in all patients, which is showing papillary edema. Visual field, basically the most common presentation on visual field is uh, peripheral visual field defect and enlarged uh, blind spot. We do uh, ultrasound and VEP in all patients just for the post-operative follow-up. So that's the video. We're going through the left nostril, mobilize the medial turbinate, and first step is the uh, removal of the alginate process in order to enter. So basically, you have to go through the uh, ethmoid sinus, both anterior and posterior ethmoid, and a little bit of sphenoid sinus to reach a target, and the target is optical keratitis. You have to identify the optical keratitis and then go over the optic nerve sheath. So a little bit of bleeding there. Uh, to control the bleeding, we use three manuals. Either we um, preoperatively, we uh, sort of pack the nose with the patty soaked in the adrenaline, diluted adrenaline, 
or you can do head and elevation, which works most of the time with a little uh, reduced blood pressure. Uh, and uh, sometimes even with that many years, if you are not able to achieve that, then you can uh, uh, just take a patty and soak it with the hydrogen peroxide and keep it there for some time. That really works. So uh, ethmoid sinus and sphenoid sinus is opened. And what we're drilling now and checking for is the optical carotid recess. So optical carotid recess, so that's optic now, and that is the carotid. So what we're doing is the small sheet of bone, which, is, which we're removing over the optic nerve, just to see the optic uh, sheep, optic nerve sheep. So this is the step because of which this procedure, uh, I'd like to pause. This is the step because of which this procedure is sort of criticized or abandoned. Uh, the optic nerve sheath fenestration is very, very important. So, oh my God, okay, go back. Optic nerve sheath is very technically challenging and very important, like technically how do you do it? So you have to take an 11 blade or sometimes you can even use a corneal knife, the corneal knife, and you have to sort of create a fenestra or a window there. Make sure you have to be very gentle and you're not poking inside. But in fact, any small injury to optic nerve can cause a big damage. So your basic idea uh, or target is just to remove the sheet without damaging the optic nerve. And once your fenestra is complete from all the side, just take a small disc punch and remove that fenestra. Okay, and once you remove that fenestra, don't ever ever put any sort of a dissector or don't cauterize. So earlier, what we've seen in our previous experience, some of the professor at the institute, there was a, a sort of routine practice of putting a very a small rotons uh, and sort of let the CSF out. But that is the problem what we were having that it was causing vision loss, especially at least early vision loss, which was later recovering. Or don't ever cauterize there for any uh, reason. If, even if there is any bleeding, you can just put a small surgery cell and that will take care of uh, any bleeding, uh, if at all, there. So the basic end point which I would like to show you is once you take your endoscope closer, can you see the CSF dripping there? So that is what the CSF dripping. I would like to show that again. So as the fenestra is taken out, a closer look at the endoscope and you can see the CSF dripping there. There is small bleeding from the optic nerve sheath, but don't do anything for that. Just put a small surgery cell and that will take care of this thing. So that was a representative video. Post-operatively vision improved uh, on the day of the shot to the counting fingers at two feet in both the what is so there is sort of like circuit so when you perform any optic nerve structure you're basically letting the csf out the csf comes out the hydrocephalus increase this hydrocephalus is the main problem so if the hydrocephalus although sometimes you may not find a prominent uh, uh ventriculomegaly but the csf pressures are always high so when you let out the csf the hydrocephalus or csf pressures comes down the CSF pressure or the hydrocephalus comes down, the headache improves. The headache improves, the sleep improves. The sleep improves, the other problem like visual loss and fertility improves. So the one pattern what we have seen. So our results for all patients who underwent, uh, six patients who underwent uh, endoscopic optic nerve sheath penetration out of the 12, the visual acuity had improved in five patients and remained stable in one patient. Papilloedema apparently improved in all the patients. Headache improved in all the patients. If you see statistically, the visual acuity and papilloedema had improved significantly. And it also improves sleep, weight loss, and fertility, as I said. If the headache improves, headache is the main problem all the patients will have. Headache improves, the sleep will improve, sleep improves, the weight loss improves, and uh, infertility also improves. A small discussion of the optic nerve sheath penetration was first reported by E. Baker in 1872 for optic uh, neuroretinitis. And uh, then in 1964, uh, this professor High and he had performed it through a little different way. So there are different ways of doing optic nerve sheath penetration. So in 1964, it was performed by this uh, doctor, Professor High and uh, by lateral orbitotomy 
with the durotomy of optic nerve sheath in rhesus monkeys. And after the durotomy, he actually uh, raised the intracranial pressure with the implanted balloon. And what he found is that it seems highly probable that the edema is mechanical in origin. So he found that once the optic nerve sheath fenestration was done, and after that, even if you artificially raise the uh, intracranial pressure, which he did with the implanted balloon, there was no papular edema. So as I said, there are various surgical approaches for making this window or slit. Uh, you can do it with the light, lateral orbitotomy, where you can just have to make a small uh, incision over the uh, eyebrow incision. Or you can do it transcranially, where you will have to de-roof the optic nerve. Or you will have you can do it uh, uh, a sort of a eyebrow eyelid uh, incision, which is called a lead incision. Uh, up so uh, there are many case reports, but all of them, they are with the small number of the patients. There is no huge uh, case study of idiopathic intracranial hypertension. No prospective trial. All of them, most of them are retrospective only. No trial of unilateral versus bilateral. But what is what we see, you know, whatever all those studies which are reported, all of them, they say that optic nerve sheath fenestration basically improves the visual acuity and visual field. They, most of them comment on the visual acuity and visual field, but not the About unilateral versus bilateral, uh, one eye or for both the eye, are, uh, a good analysis was done by uh, Professor Alusabi, and uh, he found out there were 78 patients in all the uh, uh, meta analysis. 62 had unilateral, 10 had bilateral, 6 had unilateral followed by a shunt. 20 patients were controlled in different, different uh, uh, studies. Uh, so observer was supposed to do the uh, optic, the papillary edema assessment, job two weeks, three months, six months, and 12 months. For uh, those cases where only unilateral optic nerve sheath penetration was done, papillary edema grading improved in both dyes. Although at times it was not equal, but ultimately down the line at 12 months follow up, it was equal in both dyes. So it was strategically significant. For bilateral optic nerve sheath penetration, the papillary edema grade improved and it was always equal in both dyes. Visual acuity and visual field improved significantly at 12 months follow up in both operative and post operative eye. So, uh, a small discussion about CF step shunting versus optic nerve sheath penetration. So, those are the literatures there. What we saw that there is a lack of randomized control trial to guide the therapy, and uh, there is no clear cut indication. Uh, it is basically an institutional practice or surgeon based practice. Certain institutes are following certain operations, or surgeons, sur surgeons are pressing certain operations. It depends on severity of visual loss and headache symptoms. In case of optic nerve sheath penetration, uh, literature says that headache improves in almost 50% of cases, but stabilization or improvement of visual acuity and visual field is almost in 98 or 88% respectively. So you can see that visual symptoms are more responsive to as compared to the headache in case of optic nerve sheath penetration. The complication, complication rates are sometimes ocular mobility or pupillary dysfunction. These are only in case when the ophthalmologists are operating through a lynch incision, through an eyelid incision or infection. CSF shunting, there is no significant difference between where, whether you're doing a lumboperitoneal shunt or ventriculoperitoneal or pleural or arterial shunt. But what we've seen in lumboperitoneal shunt is technically a little irritating. The available hardware is not user-friendly and there are a lot of lumboperitoneal shunt failure rates. As long as the symptoms are concerned, headache, response more better uh, in case of shunting as compared to the visual acuity. So, and uh, over the 10 years uh, follow-up, uh, uh, almost 50% of them will require shunt revision. So the trend is optic nerve sheath penetration for visual loss and shunting for the headache. That is the trend in over the last period, uh, over the literature. So uh, discussion uh, following the obesity, uh, Obviously, this uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension has become more obvious. And what uh, uh, we predict is as the way the obesity is progressing, idiopathic intracranial hypertension is going to be one of the most common non communicable diseases in case of young population a neurosurgeon is going to see. So, uh, we should have certain standard guidelines about it. That is the main reason we're doing this prospective uh, RCT. So, management of this entire 
controversy and optic nerve penetration is a promising option, especially in case of typical idiopathic intracranial hypertension, especially in case of patient with a rapid vision disorientation and patient with a perioptic CSF. There are patients who don't have perioptic CSF, so you may not get any CSF uh, leak out of that. Complication, vision loss, and infection are complications, but that uh, uh, can be improved with the technical improvement. Limitation of the study, so as long as my study is concerned, we have a smaller uh, number of sites. We have concluded it in 2018, and after that, we've got, I've got four patients. Uh, uh, endoscopic optic nerve sheath penetration is a minimally invasive and more effective procedure with a statistically significant improvement in visual acuity and severity of the papillodema and headache. And it also helps in improvement of sleep, weight loss, and indirectly helps to improve the infertility. So this is my references. Thank you very much for a kind attention. I would like to invite you all for the ACNS YNS uh, uh, monthly webinar series, which we do on the second and fourth. Uh, Sunday of every month. And the next one will be on 25th July, where we have Professor Takio Goto and Professor Ivan uh, as a guest speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hachin. Um, I have uh, no experience in uh, optic nerve sheaths penetrations. Um, can you, I mean, would you mind? Uh, uh, to, to tell us what is the objective of the fenestration? Is it is it the compression of the optic nerve or uh, some uh, CSF uh, flow from the fenestration uh, to decrease uh, hypertension or uh, or or something? Thank you. So as we know that anatomically, it's very important to understand the anatomy. And anatomically, the optic nerve is not a cranial nerve, as said by most of the uh, anatomists and neuroanatomists. They say optic nerve is just an extension of the brain. And along with that extension, even the dura extends. And when the dura extends, the subarachnoid space also extends. So that is the reason, in case of any hydrocephalus, the CSF pressure gets transmitted along the this subarachnoid space, which is around the optic nerve, and which is the reason for the papilledema. Papilledema is nothing but the swelling of the optic nerve and uh, that is basically causing uh, venous edema there because the venous flow is obscured and ultimately there will be visual atrophy optic atrophy so the basic idea of optic nerve sheath fenestration is basically you are creating another uh, shunt pathway or shunt bypass where your routine bypass is either by uh, ventricular peritoneal or pleural shunt or uh, lumboperitoneal shunt. This is sort of another bypass where you're not directly targeting the ventricles or the CSF in the spinal cord, but you're targeting that small window of subarachnoid space which is extended over the optic nerve and just create a small fenestra and let the CSF leak through that and your hydrocephalus or the CSF pressure will come down. So that is the basic idea of the optic nerve sheet penetration. Okay, thank you. Uh, so now we open the question and answer uh, session. Uh, is, is, uh, are there any questions from the audience? I have one question. Yes, it's you, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sachin, for such a wonderful lecture. And uh, uh, like uh, the main objective of uh, optic nerve sheet penetration was to release the CSF from the optic nerve. And uh, by doing endoscopically, we can see that CSF is now draining into nasal cavity. Yes. So uh, did it uh, result into meningitis from the nasal flora in any okay. case? Yeah, so thank you very much for the question. The same question I had when I started the study. In fact, I, apart from that, I had a second question that why the CSF is not leaking through the nose and coming down. So, that was my so second that, question. Yeah. So uh, apparently, I don't have an answer for that. Maybe it is uh, sort of like anatomically related that the optic nerve is towards the base, skull base there. And the fenestra which we are making is a very small fenestra. And maybe the CSF is getting uh, maybe sort of absorbed there. And... Uh, uh, every time uh, 
we are whenever we are doing it we are keeping a little bit of the, our technique involves after doing uh, optic nerve sheath fenestration we're taking a surgery cell we wrap that surgery cell uh, into a fat a small fat and keep it there so maybe that fat is working as sort of like you know a, a window or a barrier for the cf to leak out to the external uh, 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 nasal cavity and that is how it prevents the uh, infection probably okay so the uh, uh, surgery cell wrapped in the fat uh, that is what we do to prevent the uh, csf leak and infection okay so my another question thank you thank you for the uh, answer another question is like if uh, we only do decompression of bone and uh, prevent the pressure of csf on the optic nerve because now the optic sheath has enough space to expand as we have removed the bone uh, will it uh, do the uh, treatment because yeah csf okay. line again so like only by doing bony decompression can we achieve the result uh, i thank you for the question but uh, maybe uh, i would like to just give an example if there is a subdural hematoma acute subdural hematoma and we do a bony decompression we don't open the dura that won't be the target of surgery only when you open the dura then only the blood can be let out or the you know even the csf can be let out so only doing a bony decompression as we do in case of traumatic optic nerve decompression uh would not solve this problem because here the optic nerve is under the tremendous pressure because the subarachnoid space around the optic nerve is full it's filled and it is uh compressing the optic nerve so until unless you don't open up or sort of uh, make a diverta for that uh, subarachnoid space uh treatment will not be achieved the end point will not be achieved thank you thank you so much thank you i have a thank you dr ishu yeah please yeah, yeah thank you tommy so um i was reading about oxid cell which was used and uh, uh, the oxid cell is one um, hemostatic uh, material which cannot be placed near the optic nerves because it induces blindness later i'm not sure about surgery cell directly on the optic nerve so maybe you can have some more details about that and regarding the csf leak which you have did you have uh, did you know have you noticed any uh, pneumocephalus on the control ct exam of your patients after the fenestration no apparently we've never had any i doubt whether if the csf is coming out through optic nerve the air can go into the idea behind the, your question is if the csf is coming out whether if air is going inside or yeah. not Like but we we never we never saw any air is sucked in there or uh, even in the post operative scan we never saw any uh, pneumocephalus okay thank you thank you okay any more questions please okay i have one more question yes please issue i am very fascinated with this optic nerve sheath fenestration because in a case of normal hydrocephalus not idiopathic intracranial hypertension and uh, we do shunting uh, can optic nerve sheath fenestration replace the normal shunt procedure in future for normal uh, for other hydrocephalus causes because yes. ultimately we are achieving the goal uh, saving the vision yes yes i understood uh, we, even we had this uh, uh question and we sort of wanted to uh, uh make a pilot study on optic nerve sheath fenestration in case of normal hydrocephalus hydrocephalus in at least in case of a uh, uh, communicating hydrocephalus in case of adult patient especially normal pressure hydrocephalus mm -hmm. but as as i said when we reviewed the literature the shunting versus optic nerve sheath fenestration what we see is shunting responds better for patients with the headache symptoms the headache is the symptoms which responds better in case of shunting mm -hmm. fun likely uh, uh, two visual symptoms optic nerve sheath fenestration responds best for those patients who has vision at the risk uh, more as compared to the uh, headache now a normal patient which which you are talking about the patient which 
having a hydrocephalus either communicating or non communicating may because of any mass or any obstruction mm -hmm. those patients they have only headache as a primary symptoms uh, and symptoms of increased icp although there will be papillary edema but very rarely they will come with uh, any symptoms of uh, visual obscuration or visual decreased visual acuity or uh, uh, visual field defect i think that is the point which differentiates this entity idiopathic intracranial hypertension as compared to uh, other causes of hydrocephalus but uh, whether it will work or not i don't have an answer because we have not yet done it uh, maybe would like to do it but to get a uh, uh, ethical clearance would be very tough yes that's it and uh, the point the viscosity of the csf that is more in case of idiopathic yes. intracranial hypertension yes. it yes. itself favors in fa in uh, optic nerve sheath fenestration because if the shunt is put in a uh, viscous csf uh, there will be more chances of shunt failure yes i think th this point will goes in favor of um, optic nerve sheath fenestration yes so one of the so there are lot of proposed hypotheses and proposed pathogenesis of idiopathic intracranial hypertension uh, the list is very long at least 10 15 pathogenesis are there including psychosomatic and somatic illness one of the other pathogenesis as you likely said there is increased viscosity but that happens only in case of two uh, situation one is uh, if you see any uh, uh, problem which is causing uh, difficulty in absorption of csf that happens uh, when you see any obscuration or uh, stenosis or occlusion of any on, any one of the uh, transverse sinus in that case there is a venous or sinus hypertension and that's when the csf becomes more viscous because it is stagnated there and is not able to drain out so that is one situation another situation as i said the big list of the illnesses like anemia and chronic renal uh, disease and all which is causing increased viscosity but there are some patient who do not have any one of this situation but still the csf is viscous so you can't explain it that but as you likely said if the csf is viscous putting the shunt will uh include the shunt block the shunt thank you thank you thank you very much thank you dr issue and dr sachin are there any questions uh, more uh Okay, so we close this uh, session. Thank you, Dr. Sachin. It's an interesting point that uh, headache correlate with obesity and uh, idiopathic hyper, uh, intracranial hypertension. Thank you, Dr. Sachin. Um, before we close this meeting, I I invite Professor Kato for uh, giving some uh, words for uh, us uh, young neurosurgeons meeting here. Uh, please, Professor Kato. the before closing just i want to uh, invite maybe dr vladimir the tonight is very the silent dr liu maybe please say something please because andrei is from siberia that he talked a very nice the speech vladimir are you with us dr liu hi professor hi how are you Fine, fine. I'm a little bit. A mountain behind you. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> uh, it's a high Tatras in my country. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. You you you, the, you should sorry. visit my country, and uh, I will take you there, and we will. Please. Do I hope nice time. Maybe you can ask uh, something to Andrew because uh, he has a lot of experience of the virus in vascular cases. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Uh, uh, I have a lot of experience of bypass, but uh, intra intracranial bypasses, uh, I don't have a lot of experience. Around fifty uh, cases only, uh, because uh, this is a very uh, difficult uh, type of bypasses, and I. uh not every case uh, use uh, it but on the other hand there is an endovascular treatment such as a high flow or uh, was especially in the in the area now yes we have a very uh, strong endovascular team and uh, many uh, aneurysms and uh, avms we treat in uh, using uh, endovascular uh, me methods 
uh, but uh, high flow bypass we perform two and um, today our experience around uh, 70 cases of high flow bypasses so usually do you use the radial artery Yes, yes. Usually we use a radial artery. Uh, very uh, uh, small uh, number of cases we use uh, uh, Safenus vein, around four or five cases only. Do, so do, do, you, you should, do you sometimes uh, use a temporary the bypass with the uh, with radial? Uh, so your yeah, question about using a temporal artery uh, for no. bypass? Yeah. Transit bypass. Transit bypass. Yes, transit bypass. Uh, such kind ah, of yes, yes. I, I don't uh, use. Uh, I never use uh, this bypass, uh, and I think uh, this bypass is uh, uh, only one uh, doctor uh, use only once in our country. Uh, in cases of giant uh, uh, meningioma of the skull base, uh, only once. Doctor Liu. Uh, yeah, thanks, Professor Kato. Uh, thanks, Professor Andrew. Actually, I, I, I wish to find out because uh, to relate a talk by uh, Dr. Sachin uh, talking about uh, intracranial hypertension due to a venous hypertension. And uh, I think yesterday we have a webinar by Professor Zhang from Fudan uh, talking about uh, every fistula is due to venous uh, occlusion. And when he treat the venous occlusion, he improved. Uh, I think the same thing uh, in this case, uh, uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. I do not see so much logic uh, to do a fenestration if you think it's the venous uh, uh, occlusion problem. We don't treat the problem. And uh, uh, probably is probably constriction within the optic nerve is the choice. I actually, I wanted to ask Iti also, uh, is there, Professor, do you think that, uh, uh, like he show one of the uh, thrombus sinus have been occluded and that caused uh, idiopathic uh, intracranial hypertension? Uh, definitely by intervention, sometimes they can do a balloon dilatation. Uh, do you have any experience uh, related uh, some sort of uh, uh, sinus wall uh, reconstruction or, or awareness uh, bypasses uh, for those cases that you think will be helpful. Uh, thanks, Professor. Uh, Dr. Liu, I think Iti had already uh, left the, the, the room, yeah. Yeah, for it, Professor Andrew, do you think that, that is, is there any surgical vascular uh, surgeon role in treating those intracranial hypertension due to uh, venous occlusion? Thank you, Professor. Dr. Andrew, do you have a such case? No, uh, I, I don't have a such case. No. I think uh, I want to say something in this. Uh, they, there are few endovascular neurosurgeons who are doing uh, stenting of venous sinuses. And there was one study published in which uh, the doctor specifically pointed that the narrowing of uh, straight sinus uh, can cause uh, pulsatile tinnitus and uh, features of idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And by putting a stent into the sinus, and uh, uh, that resulted into good outcome of those patients. Uh, I think you want to know about uh, experience of that stent procedure. Am yeah, I right? Th yeah, thanks, Ishu. Yeah. So th uh, there is uh, people doing that intervention to, for intra intracranial hypertension. Yes, yes. And uh, they are using MR venography for that. And uh, it, uh, that consultant, I uh, forgot the name, that uh, specifically uh, mentioned that uh, these cases, they are go uh, mostly unattended because uh, tinnitus complaints and uh, uh, headache, chronic headache problems, they are uh, mostly treated by medication only. And uh, he specifically said that by doing MRI brain with MR venography, we can find those cases, uh, the, the those hidden cases, and then we can uh, give best treatment by doing venous stenting. I, I think just, just uh, I think uh, the vein is uh, no elastic layers. So I think uh, usually the stent is quite difficult because it's maybe cannot be attached the inner wall properly, I think. Yes. So I, 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 I don't know if it can be the, the suitable the treatment. Of course, one of the way, I think. Yes, one of the way. But great I, idea. 
yes but i personally don't have any experience thank you so it was a nice discussion and uh, now the time is almost over best wishes thank you very much thank you thank, thank you thank you very much thank you bye bye